Welcome to This Month in Mormon Studies. This is a new podcast hosted by Brian Whitney and Brant Malone. Uh, We're going to be discussing a recap of the month in Mormon studies, some of the book releases, some of the events uh, going on, some of the news, perhaps a little bit of the blog contributions out there. And first, I thought we'd just go ahead and introduce ourselves. Uh, So this podcast is being co-sponsored by Greg Coford Books and by the Mormon News Report. Brant, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about the Mormon News Report? Sure. So uh, my name is Brant Malone. I run the Mormon News Report. I guess you could call me the editor-in-chief. Uh, you could find the Mormon News Report at theculturalhallpodcast.com slash mormon-news-report. And what it is, I go through the day's top stories in Mormon news. I put it all in an email, and I send it out. We get about, I'd say we have about 500 subscribers, and uh, it's filled with different insights that I found. It's filled with different news stories. It's filled with a little bit of snark from me. But all in all, I'm just trying to find what's going on in Mormonism. What are people talking about? And I send it out every day. And we'll put a link to that up on the uh, the podcast so that people can check that out and subscribe to it. I highly recommend it. It's a great way to start your morning. I try and get it out by about by about 8 o'clock in the morning Eastern time. So for those of you in Utah, it's at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning. It should be in your inbox. Cracking into some of the news from this past month, Neil A. Maxwell Institute named a new director, Spencer Fluman. Spencer Fluman is well known in the Mormon study circles. He's really been spearheading the new direction of the uh, Neil A. Maxwell Institute, looking at um, the study of Mormonism from a little bit more of an academic perspective and perhaps trying to uh, solidify the reputation of Mormon studies among universities. So let me, let me just say a few things about Spencer. So on May 4th, the Maxwell Institute announced that uh, Spencer was going to be named as the new executive director. of President Kevin J. Worthen, the university president, said, given Dr. Fluman's work in deepening the understanding of the faith of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and his ability to promote respect and goodwill among people of all faiths, he is well qualified to lead the Maxwell Institute. Spencer's book, A Peculiar People, Anti-Mormonism and the Making of Religion in 19th Century America, is so, so good. And it's really one of those things that people need to read if they want to understand not just what was going on with, with Mormonism in America, but what was the impression and, and where did we come from? Why why was there so much resentment? Where did it come from? It, it, it was even there even after the death of Joseph Smith. And that's something that people need to understand. Sadly, we also have the passing of Ron Walker. Ron Walker was uh, an integral part of uh, the Mormon Studies community. He has a tremendous legacy that goes back to the Camelot era, and Ron Walker was uh, was was a very well beloved researcher. Put out a number of of great books and articles, renowned for his work on uh, the Utah War period, on Brigham Young in particular. Uh, I had an internship with the LDS Church History Department back in 2013 and 14, where I was the research assistant with uh, with Ron Walker and uh, Matt Grow on their most recent publication, which was actually Ron's last publication during his life, The Prophet and the Reformer, which is about the correspondence between uh, Brigham Young and Thomas Kane. Ron's going to be greatly missed. Yeah, we also want to recognize the honorary doctorate that George D. Smith of Signature Books fame received from the University of Utah. Uh, George was honored for his influence in publishing in Utah and his many scholarly achievements. He's done just an incredible amount for the Utah communities and for a lot of uh, history associations. He's been a major donor and good for him for for getting a honorary doctorate in humanities. So the other thing that happened this month, a first edition of the Book of Mormon was also chosen to be part of the Library of Congress's America Reads event to start on June 16th. There were 65 books that were chosen, and they were chosen because they had a profound effect on American life. Among those included were the Book of Mormon, the 1830 edition, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House in the Big Wood, Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men and East of Eden, and Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. And moving on into the blog world, the Juvenile Instructor is doing their second annual summer book club. This year they'll be studying Mormon Enigma, Emma Hale Smith, biography that was done by Linda King Newell and Valine Tippett's Avery. The book club follows up their second year after uh, last year they did Joseph Smith's Rough Stone Rolling, and that garnered quite a bit of publicity from the Salt Lake Tribune, from Religious News Service. They even had Richard Bushman commenting on it. If you're interested, they're really kicking this off next week on June 6th. They've got a reading list on the juvenileinstructor.org blog site where they'll tell you what chapters need to be read by when and then there'll be some great scholarly conversation done by very adept historians to kind of flesh this out and give you a little bit more of a broader background and contextualization of Emma Smith's life. I, I can't recommend this enough. I 
wasn't really a commenter. I was more of a lurker last year when they did Rough Stone Rolling. But if you ever wanted like a commentary track for a book that you're reading, this is it, especially when it comes to something like either Joseph Smith or Emma Smith, which is these are incredibly complex characters that played a huge role in our religion. And to be able to have people like Richard Bushman and other accomplished academics chiming in, offering their thoughts, seeing a little bit of a back and forth, it's so good. So if anyone has ever wanted to have an excuse to buy this book to get started, this is it right here. Like, it's so good. I, I can't stop. I can't get more excited about it. So one of the other things that happened this month, um, there was a CES fireside by Elder Richard J. Maines, and it was given to young adults. And let me just read the first part of his uh, talk. Joseph Smith Jr. wrote or dictated four known accounts about the first vision, and his contemporaries recorded five accounts of what they heard Joseph say about the vision. Uh, see history.lds.org. And he goes through and he lists these accounts. And this is, again, this is a CES devotional to young adults. This is kind of a big deal, and Dave Bannock over at Times and Seasons comments on it and basically says that it, it's a good start, but, to, to quote Dave, the problem with a harmonized account, which is what uh, Elder Maines does further on in his talk, the problem with a harmonized account, of course, is that it is almost certainly not accurate. He's basically saying that it, there's value in trying to line these up and say, okay, what themes do we see here? What, what things are, are common? The downside is when you try and line it up and make sure it's 100% perfect when you line it up to say, see, it, it, it works perfectly. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. So on the one hand, a big yay to Elder Main and um, the CES group for actually giving a talk where it's going to talk about these things that most of these people listening are going to encounter uh, maybe a thumb in the middle for trying to harmonize instead of just trying to give people a little more context for as to how to encounter some of these things. For a scholarly discussion on the First Vision accounts, Doug Fabrizio of KUER's Radio West hosted Patrick Mason and John Turner on May 16th, where they had a lengthy and I think a pretty fruitful discussion on the topic. Uh, Patrick Mason, if you're not familiar, is the chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University and recently published Planted, Belief and Belonging in the Age of Doubt. He uh, co-published that with the Neely Maxwell Institute and Deseret Book Company. And John Turner is the award-winning author of Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet, probably the most substantial biography that we've had of Brigham Young to date, and uh, also recently published The Mormon Jesus, a biography. Doug's also the best interviewer out there right now. Bar none. He, he might even be better than you, Brian. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Doug is absolutely phenomenal. There's no question about it. Going back to uh, Ron Walker's death, Matt Groh, who worked very, very closely, as mentioned with, uh, with Ron Walker during the last years of his life, wrote a touching uh, post for him that was published on By Common Consent on May 11th. One of the things that he wrote in his blog post that was particularly touching that I thought I would share here is he wrote, in my estimation, Ron was the best stylist in the field of Mormon history over the past generation. He wrote beautiful prose. He particularly excelled at the writing of articles. Ron knew how to set the stage, how to draw the reader in, how to tell an engaging story, how to delve into personalities, how to point to broader significance. Art, he insisted, was part of the historian's craft. From every memoriam that I've read, it's always seemed like people have very fond memories of Ron, and Ron was a guy that was always willing to open up his office, always willing to talk with people. You, you talked about his writing style. Um, Massacre at Mountain Meadows, had it, it's a tough subject, and I think that you could definitely see Ron's style and influence in there. We lost a good one in Ron Walker. Brian, let me ask you a question. When did the Gospel Topics essays start? Uh, I want to say January of 2013 might have been the first one. Ooh, that's, that's uh, good timing. I, the only information I have here is it's uh, 2013. Marianne over at Wheaton Terrace has a very interesting blog post looking at the Gospel Topics essay. So for those of you who aren't aware, um, there have been 13 essays. The last essay was um, this last year in the fall. They've addressed topics uh, from women, uh, the temple, uh, the priesthood, mother in heaven, polygamy. I mean, basically any any one of the, the big hitter issues within Mormonism, they've, they've addressed them. And so her blog post is basically, what are we supposed to do about these essays? Uh, what have people done with them? What are we supposed to think? I'm going to read just a, a small snippet of what she has to say. Uh, given the most recent press release, which talked about the ending of the essays and the last essay that went out, people probably don't need to fear being released from callings for using the essays in the church. However, what about regular members? In talking with others, it seems incorporation of these essays at the ward level is inconsistent. Some wards are gung-ho, others stay away from controversial topics like the plague, 
Some states have begun weeknight classes covering the essays. Others prefer to leave controversial subjects to personal study. We as a church are going to have to figure out what are we going to do about it. Uh, on, on the one hand, yes, it's, it's out there. We can say it. Uh, I know that it's being included in things like um, seminary institute manuals, um, some of the CES curriculums. Um, I, I believe it's going to try and be included in some of our Sunday school curriculums. But at the same time, if it's something that makes someone uncomfortable and they don't want to get into it, uh, it, it might never get used. I, I can tell you from, from my perspective, from my ward here in Detroit, um, we've actually kind of been petitioning our bishop for a while to use those Fifth Sunday uh, Combined Priesthood and Relief Society lessons that we have to take one of the essays and talk about it and let people know here's where it's at. The downside with that is there's only what, three or four fifth Sundays in an entire year. But I think it's a thought-provoking essay to basically say, we have this information now, we have these essays, now what are we going to do with it as a church? Let's go back into Juvenile Instructor, another article that, that was published just a few days ago by Matt Bowman. He interviewed another historian by the name of Stephen Taysom. He's working currently on a biography of Joseph F. Smith, and uh, this is the, uh, the first time he's really delved into the biography genre. He's got a lot to say about it. One of the things that uh, Steve mentioned in this article that really struck me was how uh, you know, there's these little snippets that we have of people that they leave behind, whether it's their uh, journal writings, whether it's correspondence, whether it's meeting minutes or whether it's uh, things that have been written about them, maybe in newspaper articles or perhaps uh, just other people writing about uh, their interactions with uh, this historical figure. And it strikes you at some point that are you really capturing them? Are you really capturing the essence of who this person is by the things that they have left behind? And, and it got me, to, got me thinking when I was reading through this, some of the work that I had done on Brigham Young, how often I would come across things and say, ah, this explains Brigham Young's uh, kind of paradoxical character or perhaps a sense of humor. And I'd wonder, would Brigham agree with that? Would he say that this even resembles him? Uh, or would he say you, that we're dwelling on things that were really immaterial to him? Stephen brings up some of those complications in the writing of biography. And I think that it's well worth the read, whether you are somebody who writes history or whether you're somebody who's interested in reading history, because it, it will show you how uh, how tenuous our interpretations can be over a figure and that we're trying to present. Yeah, and, I, and I'd say, going along with that, that that's... It's, it's really important for anyone who wants to start getting serious about Mormon studies or even just more academic studies in general. Again, I, I'm, I'm not an academic, but I, I sit here and think about how many times have we ascribed uh, our, our own personal morals on, on people from history or even our 2016 morals and in, in the world that we live in to those people in history. You, know, you bring up your Brigham Young example to be able to say, okay – Either this was right or this was wrong, so he must have had um, altruistic or malicious intent with this. When the, the tougher part in, in the biography is just trying to sit there and go, okay, so who was the person? And then you as a reader having to ask yourself, okay, is this an accurate representation of them? Is this that, art, that author's representation? Can you ever get away? Can you ever get a truly objective biography? And it's, it's really good, especially for people who want to understand a lot of the dynamic characters within Mormonism and how they've been written about. Let's move into some of the new releases over this past month. It's been a fairly busy month for publishers, particularly the University of Utah Press. Man, they have just been hitting it out of the park uh, with the pa past few uh, releases that they've done. Uh, but let's start off with, I'm proud uh, about this publication. This is uh, one of our own, Greg Coford. Uh, Adam Miller has put out his second book with, uh, with Greg Coford, uh, this one entitled Future Mormon, Essays on Mormon Theology. Follows up Rube Goldberg Machines, uh, but it takes it into a slightly different direction. Perhaps it's a little bit more cohesive as opposed to a lot of different thoughts being collected together. This one is definitely directed more at uh, kind of a future audience and some of the theological possibilities of Mormonism. This book, I think, would make a great follow-up for Letters to a Young Mormon that he published with the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. And uh, I think it's, it's a great book for those who are interested in, in kind of seeing where Mormonism could be what we could be doing to kind of expand our ideas on Mormon thought. And, you know, it's not too, uh, it's not too over the head of a lot of people. It's a very easy way to get into Adam. Adam is a very dense writer, and some of his stuff, if you're not used to it, can be a bit intimidating. But this, this and Letters to a Young Mormon are two of, the, two of my favorite things that he's written. So the next one that's coming out, Brian mentioned uh, University of Utah Press just, just being insane this month as far as releases. Kate Holbrook and Matt Bowman had a collection of essays that they uh, 
edited called Women in Mormonism, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives. There's been so much talk within the last little bit about women and Mormonism from people like Nyla McBain putting out a really influential book, Women at Church, to um, the ordained women group and, and, and talk about advocacy of the priesthood to just women's issues in general as being a focus. And this book was a great primer in saying these are the historical issues that are out there. These are some of the historical narrative perspectives that are out there. But more importantly, and, and this was my favorite part of the book, was taking a look at the contemporary social science perspectives and personal perspectives. And this book really does have a lot of who's who within Mormon studies. For example, you've got people like Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, uh, Christine Wright, Jonathan Stapley, uh, David E. Campbell, Jennifer Finlayson Fife, who who is well known as far as uh, uh, her work on Mormon sexuality. She's got a, an essay in here on sexuality. Really, really good book. Um, I definitely recommend it for people who are interested in getting a little bit deeper into Mormonism and women's studies. Really, really good. Can't recommend it highly enough. And then Greg Prince has a new book out, his biography on Leonard Arrington. Now, I haven't picked up a copy of this yet, but you have, Brant, so why don't you go ahead and talk about it? So, let me give you a little bit of context. Um, I've started doing a little thing on social media. I'll take the book that I'm reading for the week. Um, I'll steal a little bit of my two-and-a-half-year-old daughter's snacks when we're at church on Sunday. Uh, I'll take a picture, I'll post it on Facebook, and I'll call it The Snacks of Sunday. Um, this Leonard Arrington book that I brought to church, from a social media perspective and then a, like an in-person perspective, there were so many people who were talking about it and wanted to know a little bit more information from people who basically said, I don't know who Leonard Arrington is. And I got the honor to be able to say, let me tell you about one of the coolest times in Mormon history as far as the, the studies perspective to people who had nothing but fond things to say about Leonard Arrington. The greatest part about Greg Print, if you've ever read uh, David O. McCain, The Rise of Modern Mormonism, this is very familiar in the sense that he's going to take a lot of themes and he's going to craft a narrative around that theme. So instead of your usual, uh, he was born here and then he died here and we're going to cover everything in the middle, it's taking these snippets of his life and trying to give more perspective. Prince has a great way of writing, and I really enjoyed this. I would say it's not necessarily for everybody, um, but if you are someone who knew of Leonard Arrington and he had some sort of an impact on your life, you're going to love this book. Another important publication that uh, came out this month, this is long-awaited Martha Bradley Evans, published Glorious in Persecution, Joseph Smith, American Prophet, 1839-1844. This is published with the Smith Pettit Foundation, part of a multi-volume biographical series on the life of Joseph Smith that Smith Pettit Foundation is publishing. Uh, this volume concentrates on Smith's later years in Nauvoo up through his assassination, and it looks at the role of persecution in forming Smith's prophetic identity. Now, I'm familiar with Martha Bradley's work on Mormon women's history, most notably her award-winning book, Pedestals and Podiums, which looked at the history of the ERA movement in the mid-20th century. It's uh, one of the most thorough and often overlooked books on that period. It's going to be interesting to see what her take on Joseph Smith is. And then, of course, a significant volume has been released by the Joseph Smith Papers this, uh, this month. This is the fourth volume in their Documents series. Uh, this volume covers the years 1834 and 1835, and uh, so it's going to cover things like uh, Zion's Camp, uh, one write-up that I'd uh, read on it said that the paper reveals Smith's preoccupation with redeeming Zion even after the Army of Israel, which we call Zion's Camp, disbanded, and his own efforts to raise funds for the Kirtland Temple, new organizational offices. So this is where we start seeing some of the priesthood hierarchy solidify and emerge with the different offices, uh, including the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. I think one of the, the things about Volume 4 in particular that was interesting to me was uh, that it catalogs the women that were involved with the Army of Israel and uh, gives a little bit more of a detailed background behind them and some of the efforts that they did to support uh, some of the Zion's camp stuff. So it brings out a little bit more women's history, which is great, much needed. And, and if I remember correctly, can't you find most of the information in the book form of the, the Joseph Smith Papers book on the Joseph Smith Papers website? I think the only thing they really kind of withhold is some of their introductions to the volumes, which are great. Uh, the introductions uh, really do a good job of summarizing and encapsulating what the volume is about, as well as having a little historical interpretation in them. But yeah, if you're looking for just the meat of the volumes, uh, the the journal entries themselves, the documents themselves, then they will have most of that on their website for free. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the other books that came out this month, again, from the University of Utah Press, was Patrick Mason's edited book of Directions for Mormon Studies in the 21st Century. 
this book is probably not going to be for everybody. I say that because um, if you're just someone who's casual into Mormon studies, you really don't care about methodology or different areas or, or where are we going next, you're probably not going to like this. But if you're someone who's been fairly well-versed in a lot of these things, who follows it, who keeps tabs on what's happening in the developments, you're really going to like this. Um, I enjoyed it, but then again, I, I like following it. Whereas I had another friend who looked at that and said, that sounds like the most boring thing ever. So again, not for everybody, <laughs> but if you like Mormon studies, I think you're going to like this one. Finally, uh, Laura Hales, uh, who is most noted for her work with her husband, Brian Hales, on, uh, on Joseph Smith's polygamy series. And, but she just recently co-published through the Brigham Young University Religious Study Center, as well as Deseret Book, uh, a little nifty volume called A Reason for Faith. It's kind of a primer on a lot of the big questions that uh, people come across when they're uh, perhaps on social media. Maybe they come across websites or blog posts or things that bring into question uh, a lot of the historical aspects or claims of the church. Uh, some of the big questions that people have, such as the multiple accounts of the first vision, the translation process of the Book of Mormon, anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith's practice of plural marriage, Freemasonry in the temple. you got a lot of questions that are being addressed here by a pretty wide variety of uh, scholars and people who are involved in Mormon studies field. Uh, right off the bat, first article is contributed by Richard Bushman. Yeah. So Laura also sent me a copy of the book. I read it, and I think it was good. I, I think when you have people like Bushman who are basically kind of after Laura's introduction, leading off the bat. That sets a very good tone for the rest of the book. I think it's a very valuable book for friends of people who might be having questions about um, the LDS faith, for loved ones, for uh, LDS church leaders who are trying to understand a lot of this. But if you're someone who's going through some of those faith questions, I don't know if it's going to give you the answers you want, um, but it is, it is a valuable resource, mostly because it, it allows you to at least lay a foundation to say, okay, here's what some people have said. And so I think from that aspect, I would definitely recommend it to bishops, stake presidents, elders, quorum presidents, Relief Society presidents, um, wives, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. But for someone who's already going through those questions and maybe already read some stuff on the Internet, I don't know if it's going to give them the, the impact that they want it to have. Yeah, hopefully, if nothing else, it gives them an alternative perspective to know that there are different ways of answering some of these tough historical questions uh, that they have. And maybe they might not be so sold on these answers. Maybe they're not so sold on some of the answers that they see on uh, other uh, critical websites or whatever. Uh, but just knowing that there are different approaches and different ways of looking at things sometimes can make a world of difference. Uh, other contributors to this volume are notable. Stephen Harper, who's been, done a lot of work on the First Vision. Brant Gardner, who's a co uh, Coford author, who's done a lot of work on Book of Mormon, both from a historical perspective and a translation perspective. His work on the translation of Book of Mormon is phenomenal. Really some strong contributions in this book that uh, that I think are very well worth uh, taking note of and, and reading. But like you, my fear is, is that you would have parents buying this book because they know that their children are going through questions and they're not reading it themselves rather they're just handing it to them and saying here this will fix everything exactly yeah. uh, and that's and that's that's I don't think that was the intention of the book I don't think Laura wants that to be the intention in fact she makes it very clear in her uh, in her introduction that she wrote this because she was a mother who wanted to answer questions and who didn't know where to turn to so she's really writing this for them to read it themselves and be able to have a more engaging conversation with their children and, and if any of you are interested I also have an interview with Laura on the Cultural Hall website where we talked about some of these things that are going on. Uh, if you want to get a little bit more information about the book, that's a good place to go, and we'll include that in the show notes. So let's finish up with some of the events and academic news that's going on. Uh, why don't you go ahead and kick us off with what Brian Birch is up to? Sure. So I get really jealous of those of you who live in Utah who are close to places like the University of Utah where they have a lot of their, – their Mormon studies program and the different Mormon studies events that are going on make me incredibly jealous. So one of the ones that Brian is going to be doing, it's going to be a course this coming year. It's called uh, Reason, Faith, and Science Among the Latter-day Saints, the Intellectual Life of Mormonism. Uh, it, it explores the development and contemporary landscape of Mormon intellectual life. It, basically, any side of Mormon intellectualism, Brian's going to get into it. The thing that I like the most about it is he puts his syllabus, his schedule, and his readings out there. So even though I might not be able to attend in person, I can still go through his readings and take a look at the uh, second class that he's going to do, which is the 19th century context, perspicuity, common sense, and revelation, and look at the readings that he's going to do and say, okay, there's a lot of that stuff that I could find online, or there's a lot of that stuff that I have in my library. I can read along with it and figure out where they're going. 
And then do you also want to talk about another thing that's happening at the University of Utah, a uh, Mormonism and Religious Studies workshop? Sure. So, <clears throat> and Brian, you'll have to help me out. Uh, Jay Stewart and Chris W. I'm not really sure who I, their full names. I just know them from online. Well, I know jo- I know Joseph Stewart. Chris W. I'd have to think about who that is. Okay. Anyways, Joseph Stewart is going to be running a workshop on Mormonism in religious studies. It's going to happen at the University of Utah on Tuesday, June 7th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. But here's the interesting thing about what they're going to be doing. As participants, you're going to be presenting a colleague's paper for the rest of the group. You'll be responsible for introducing the paper to the group and assessing the paper's strengths and weaknesses. And they're also going to discuss trends in Mormon studies. So, for example, they're going to read uh, Jan Ships, Richard Bushman, the story of Joseph Smith and Mormonism. They're going to read something by Stephen Taysom. They're going to read a roundtable on what will we do now in the new Mormon his- now that the new Mormon history is old. So we talked a little bit earlier about uh, Patrick Mason's really great book on Mormonism in the 21st century. This is kind of following that same theme, which is, okay, so we've gotten over the Mormon moment. Now what? Now we're in the public sphere. Now Mormon studies are starting to get more legitimate. What do we do about that? And then, of course, we've got the uh, annual conference of the Mormon History Association coming up. That's uh, coming up real quick here next week, June 9th through the 11th in Snowbird, Utah. Uh, we're going to link to the preliminary program on this. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about who's presenting. Let's just say that it is a action-packed few days with a lot of noteworthy and well-known and well-loved and well-published uh, scholars within the field of Mormon studies. A uh, couple of highlights that have been talked about, uh, however, are Andrea Rodkey Moss, who has been doing quite a bit of work on the Missouri conflict and particularly its effect on women. She's found, uh, it's tragically enough, a number of uh, incidents of rapes uh, that have taken place during the uh, Missouri conflict. Uh, she had presented earlier in the year at the LDS Church History Symposium, which took place at uh, Brigham Young University, and, and she'd presented a powerful paper that uh, discussed the strong likelihood that Eliza Snow was one of the victims uh, to rape in Missouri and the effect that it had on her life. So not an easy topic, but very important research uh, to come out of that. And she'll be presenting more at the Mormon History Association conference. As well, um, Ugo Perego, who is a geneticist, uh, has been working for a long time on the Joseph Smith uh, family line and looking for other descendants of Joseph Smith, perhaps outside of his marriage to Emma, some of his polygamous and uh, polyandrous marriages. He promises he's got some new research coming out, and this is in particular uh, regards to Josephina Lyon, uh, who her mother um, had mentioned that she was uh, Joseph Smith's uh, child. So we will see what Ugo has to say. He's keeping his lips sealed. I've tried. <laughs> I pried into him and said, hey, you know, I, if I don't make it to MHA and if I get hit by a bus, I got to know what's going on here. And he said, well, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so anyway, he's going to be presenting there on a panel with Brian Hales and with Don Bradley, both of whom have done a tremendous amount of work on uh, the topic of Joseph Smith's polygamy. Finally, I just wanted to mention that the Mormon Women History Initiative team are going to be doing an old Relief Society style bazaar as a fundraiser. If you stop by their table, you'll see some fantastic paraphernalia, and hopefully you'll give them all sorts of money so that they can raise some funds for great women's history initiatives. So if we look beyond MHA, here's a few events you might want to put on your calendar if you're in the Salt Lake area, or if you're like me and you're not, you could just sit back and be jealous. The first one, uh, Greg Prince is going to be at a couple of events in the Salt Lake area, uh, talking about his latest biography on Leonard Arrington. So beginning on Wednesday, June 8th, he'll be at Benchmark Books from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. And on Thursday, June 9th, he'll be at Brad Kramer's Writ and Vision in Provo at 7 p.m. And Greg Coford Books has a couple of upcoming author events as well at Written Vision. Adam Miller will be discussing his recent publications, including Future Mormon, on June 14th at 6 p.m. And Jack Harrell who is a recent author added to the Greg Coford roster, is going to be speaking on a panel with Boyd Peterson. He's the editor of Dialogue Journal. Uh, Darlene Young and Eric Samuelson, a a well-known playwright in the Utah area, about Mormon literature and writing on June 28th. This event is going to be celebrating the release of Jack Harrell's new book, Writing Ourselves, Essays on Creativity, Craft, and Mormonism. On June 23rd, Dr. Matthew Godfrey from the Joseph Smith Papers will be presenting on the topic of the Zion's Camp Expedition. This event is going to be free to the public, and it will be held on Temple Square in the Assembly Hall at 7 p.m. 
Dr. Godfrey is one of the volume editors for the most recent Joseph Smith Papers Documents, Volume 4, and has tons of interesting insight into this topic. And that wraps us up for our first episode of This Month in Mormon Studies. It's been great having you, Brant. Well, thank you. It's and been fun. This podcast will be hosted through the Greg Coford Books uh, website, and it will be available on iTunes and Google Play and all the other uh, podcast feed sites. So if you want to subscribe to it through there, we'll accompany this with a page full of links to everything that we've discussed. 